Hello everyone. In today's video, I'll be ranking all of the one-time race winners in Formula 1 history. To be honest, this is one of the most difficult rankings I've had to make. First of all, there are 36 drivers here, and secondly, most one-time winners came with a caveat or two. Most of the drivers from the 70s and back were either killed in action, part of the Indianapolis 500 from 1950 till 1960, or would be considered chaotic on my alignment chart video because of their bolt out of the blue wins. The more recent drivers are easier to rank, although four of them are still racing, so if you're watching this a few years later in the future, the info here might be wrong. Also, I'm only ranking drivers based on their F1 races that they did, not in other series. Anyway, with all of that being said, let's get into the video. Let's first address the elephant in the room. Yes, I will be counting winners of the Indy 500 from 1950 to 1960 in this list. In the record books, they are F1 drivers just like Fangio, Ascari and Sterling Moss were. In his three Indy 500 races that were eligible for the F1 season in 1950, 1951 and 1954, Lee Wallard came 6th in 1950, won the 1951 race and failed to qualify in 1954. One win in only three races. Easily the worst on this list. Bob Swiker entered five consecutive Indy 500s from 1952 to 1956, winning the 1955 edition. His second best result was sixth place in 1956, although he was killed later that year in a crash at Salem Speedway after he clipped a steel beam that was protruding onto the track. His car then violently flipped over the embankment and he landed 100 feet below and the car burst into flames. Swiker was pronounced dead on arrival to the hospital. Pat Flaherty had six Indy 500 starts in the 1950s, taking the win in the 1956 event, and curiously, with this one result, he finished fifth in that year's F1 championship standings. Outside of that, he only had two tenth place finishes in 1950 and 55 as his best other results, but he survived a deadly era of racing, unlike some of his fellow competitors. The winner of the first Indy 500 on the F1 calendar in 1950, Johnny Parsons only got one of the top five during the F1 era of the race, a fourth place in 1956, and got tenth in 1952. Other than that, there was one other storyline in his Indy career, and that was that he failed to qualify for the 1957 race. But Dick Rathman, who hadn't failed to qualify, was mugged the day before the race, and thus Parsons was drafted in as a replacement for him. The youngest winner of the Indy 500 and the youngest F1 race winner until 2003, Troy Ruttman, won the 1952 edition of the American race, also getting fourth in 1953. Those were his only top tens of the decade, and that's why he's so low on this list. Let's break the Indy driver mould with some F1 drivers. Giancarlo Baghetti won his first ever Formula 1 race at Rheim in 1961, but failed to get any other podiums in his career and failed to even get any points after 1962. He's the F1 definition of a one-hit wonder, as he could not build on his maiden win. As we move into the top 30, Peter Geffen raced an F1 for five seasons from 1970 until 1974, and outside of his shock win in the 1971 Italian Grand Prix, which was the last race at Monza without the chicanes, with the whole race basically being a slipstream fest, Geffen only got two other points finishes in his F1 career, sixth at Mont Tremblant in 1970 and sixth again at Monza the year after his win. If he hadn't won that race, he'd be a nobody, and that's why he's so low on this list. Vittorio Brambilla was known for being a crash-prone nut job, and he got his only F1 win in the 1975 Austrian Grand Prix in the pouring rain, but he failed to even get under the podium in his entire career. His next best result was fourth in Zolder in 1977, and in total, he retired from 40 of his 79 total F1 races, just showing how chaotic he was. Ludovico Scarfiotti only started 10 Formula 1 races between 1963 and 1968, and he won the 1966 Italian Grand Prix at Monza in a Ferrari. His next best results were two fourth places in 1968, surely preceding his death in a hill climb event in Germany. Joe Bonnier got his only pole position and his only win in the 1959 Dutch Grand Prix, but he ran races from 1956 until 1971, picking up a total of 39 career points. His best result, outside of his win, was fourth place in the 1958 Morocco Grand Prix, and he was a big advocate for safety in racing before he was killed in the 1972-24 hours of Le Mans, aged 42. Ina's Ireland is the first primarily Formula 1 driver on this list who got podiums outside of their only win. Before he won the 1961 US Grand Prix at Watkins Glen, he achieved two second places and a third place during 1960 in Zandvoort, Riverside and Silverstone respectively. After his win, however, he failed to finish on the podium with his best result being a pair of fourth places in 1963 in Zandvoort and Monza. 
Jochen Massa's Formula One career wouldn't have been poignant if it wasn't for his 1975 to 1977 stint with McLaren, as he played the number two role to Emerson Fittipaldi and James Hunt. He scored his sole win and all of his podiums in that three year stretch. His only win came in the infamous 1975 Spanish Grand Prix, which was stopped early due to the accident involving Rolf Stommelen, which killed four spectators on lap 29. His next best result was second in the 1977 Swedish Grand Prix, and he also got a smattering of third places, the last of which coming in the penultimate race of 1977 in Canada. After his last podium, he faded into obscurity until he retired from Formula 1 following the 1982 season because he felt guilty about both a fatal accident that killed Gilles Villeneuve and a more minor crash he had with Mauro Baldi later in that season, which he felt he was responsible for. He was a good driver, but his win came due to circumstance, not due to talent. Gunnar Nilsson was a young prodigy who was rising through the F1 ranks, and towards the mid part of the 1977 season, he was really coming into his own, taking his first win in Zolder and his third career podium in third place at the third race since he won in Silverstone. However, by this point, his health was starting to go downhill as he had been suffering from testicular cancer. He would not start any race after the 1977 season due to his debilitating condition, and he died in late 1978, aged 29. It was a shame because he really could have improved his win tally, but it seems the racing gods wanted something else. Piero Taruffi was definitely better than his record suggests. His win came in the 1952 Swiss Grand Prix, probably helped by the fact that Ferrari's lead driver Alberto Ascari had buggered off to do the Indy 500. Outside of his solitary win, he amassed numerous second and third places, but as expected, all he is remembered for by people who didn't read his book is his win. The man who the Interlagos F1 circuit is named after won only one race in his career, and it was the race at Interlagos in 1975. Jose Carlos Pache got a handful of other podiums before dying in an aircraft accident a few days after the South African Grand Prix in 1977, which was already on a solemn note as Tom Price and race marshal Jansen van Vuren had both been killed in a gruesome accident in that race. Despite this, Pache was clearly a capable driver who still had lots to give, having been 32 when he died. Jean-Pierre Beltoise was mostly a mid-pack driver during his F1 stint in the early 70s, who showed flashes of brilliance. His biggest flash came in the rain in Monaco in 1972, where he was peerless in the wet conditions, beating the rain master Jackie Ickes in second place by 38 seconds to win. He got a handful of other podiums, but never showed potential like that ever again. Luigi Musso took seven podiums in his F1 career, including his only win in the 1956 Argentine Grand Prix in a shared win with Juan Manuel Fangio. He finished third in the 1957 championship and was looking to improve on that result in 1958 before he was killed in the French Grand Prix that year, having pushed the car too hard and crashed out. He was in a lot of debt at the time and wanted to win the French race because it had the biggest prize money of any race on the calendar. He was also known for his intense rivalry with Mike Hawthorne and Peter Collins, but that's not the point of this video, so I won't go too far into that. Luigi Fagioli was a pre-war racing veteran by the time he was signed to the Alfa Romeo Works team for 1950, aged 52. He picked up the scraps of Giuseppe Farina and Juan Manuel Fangio's title battle in the opening season of Formula 1, finishing third in that season's standings despite not winning a race. After missing the opening few races of 1951, he came back at the French Grand Prix, and midway through the race, at a pit stop, he had to hand his healthy car over to Juan Manuel Fangio while he took over the Argentine's faulty machine. Fagioli was disgruntled by this choice and felt that it was disrespectful to do something like that to a veteran of his calibre. Fangio went on to win in Fagioli's car, meaning that both Fangio and Fagioli were credited with the win. Despite his win, numerous podiums and veteran status, he never led a lap in his F1 career. Yes, he won an F1 race without leading a lap. Shared drives could throw up some oddball results. Back to the Indy winners, Roger Ward is only this low because most of his good results came after 1960, by which point Indy was off the F1 calendar. He got the race win in 1959 and second in 1960. Also, Roger was a designer of Pocono Raceway, a track very familiar to those of oval racing knowledge, known as a tricky triangle due to its challenging three-corner triangle-shaped layout. Jimmy Bryan got second in the 1954 edition of the Indy 500 before getting third in 1957 and winning it in 1958. Jimmy was also killed in an accident at the infamous Langhorne Speedway on the same day that Alan Stacey and Chris Brister were killed in the 1960 Belgian Grand Prix. For those unaware, Langhorne was at the time a dirt oval that was literally shaped like a circle. The fact that you were always turning left meant you always had a blind spot on your left side as you came around the constant radius corner and you had less time to react in the event of a crash, so it was inevitable that people were going to die there. 
Sam Hanks finished third twice and second once at the Indy 500 before winning it in 1957 and promptly he retired from racing. There is a lot of lore surrounding Hanks. He won the Indy race on his 13th attempt, the most of any Indy 500 winner, and he is also believed to be the only Indy driver to race before World War II, then serve in the war, then return to racing. Another fact believed about him is that he may have been a distant relative of Abraham Lincoln. The last Indy racer on this list, Jim Rathman finished second three times in the Indy 500 in 1952, 57 and 59 before winning the last Indy 500 to feature on the F1 calendar in 1960. He is the best of all the Indy 500 winners from 1950 to 1960, bar Bill Vukovic, who won a 1953 and 54 edition, who's not on this list. The names like Rathman, Ward and Hanks may not be of note to most non-Americans, but the Indy 500, whether we like it or not, is part of F1 history that must be respected as such and not be pushed aside like some historians believe it should be. Heike Kovalainen was a driver with tons of potential after his opening season with Renault in 2007, which saw him beat experienced midfield teammate Giancarlo Fisichella. He moved to McLaren in 2008 but was overshadowed by Lewis Hamilton for 95% of his opening season. He got pole in Silverstone and got his only win in Hungary after assuming the lead from Felipe Massa with three laps remaining as the Brazilian's engine had blew up on the main straight. 2009 showed a clear golfing class between Lewis and Heike because Kovalainen couldn't even get a podium while Lewis won twice in an admittedly subpar McLaren. His seasons from 2010 to 2012 in Bad Lotuses and Caterhams were good as he got the most out of his terrible machinery, although his sub in for Kimi Raikkonen in 2013 towards the end of the season was also subpar as Heike failed to score any points in what was the third or fourth quickest car that year. Lorenzo Bandini is another what-if story as he was killed before his chance came to better his tally of one Grand Prix win. Born in modern-day Kenya, the Italian driver won the only race held at the Austrian airfield in Zeltweg, and his next best results were two second places in Monaco in 1965 and 1966. He also got five of the third places, and in the 1967 Monaco Grand Prix, he was running second behind Denny Horn. Unfortunately, he clipped the inside barrier of the Nouvelle Chicane, a corner that at the time was taken at a much higher speed until it was reprofiled in the late 1980s. Seriously, if you look at the onboards that exist from this era, if you go off, you're either in a world of trouble or in a world of death. Unfortunately, the latter happened to Bandini. As he clipped the inside barrier, his car flipped and went into the hay bales still surrounding the Monaco circuit during this era. Sparks ignited the bales, lighting a fire that trapped Bandini inside until the marshals could get him out. But as the marshals turned the car over, a second fire erupted on the spilt fuel and there was an explosion. By the time Bandini was removed from the accident, he'd suffered third degree burns on 70% of his body, amongst other injuries, and he died in hospital three days later, aged 31. While he succumbed to his injuries, his death did facilitate a massive change to the safety protocols put in place at F1 events, as hay bales were prohibited from further use in Formula 1 events due to their tendency not to have much crash protection and their tendency to be a fire hazard. Alessandro Nonini spent two years driving for the hopeless Minardi team in its infancy in 1986 and 87 before he was picked up by Benetton for 1988, but he struggled in his first year as he was outshone by teammate Thierry Boutsen, although Nonini did pick up two third places in Silverstone and Jerez. 1989 saw two more third places in Imola and then again at Silverstone, then at the second to last round in Suzuka, he was running third behind Ayrton Senna and Alain Prost before the two collided at the Casio Triangle. Prost was out, but Senna got a push start, went down the escape road and rejoined the circuit. Nonini led for two laps before Senna recovered enough time to overtake the Italian. Senna won with Nanini second, but as we all know, Senna was disqualified for cutting the chicane and Nanini was accredited with the win. Now you could say he was a lucky or circumstantial winner, but I think that he was already in a good position and capitalised on an unfortunate situation in front of him. It's not like any driver like him has control over the stewards' decisions. Not like Alan Prost did, oh wait, I wasn't supposed to say that. He rounded off 1989 with second in Adelaide and then took three more podiums in 1990 in Imola, Hockenheim and Jerez. The week after the Jerez race, he was involved in a helicopter crash and in it he severed his right forearm. He was touted to replace Nigel Mansell at Ferrari before his injury, but his injury ended his Formula 1 career. Hold on. So you're telling me he had a severed forearm and was touted to drive for Ferrari 20 years or so before Robert Kubica would have the same fate befalling him? Now, this would be an amazing opportunity to segue into a section on Robert Kubica. However, he's not next on this ranking. Anyway, Nanini recovered enough to return to saloon car racing in the mid-1990s and he nearly won DTM, but he was taken out of the final race of the 1994 season. I would give more detail, but I've never really watched the BTCC or DTM, nor any sort of touring car racing. Alessandro is still an inspiration to me and lots of other disabled people that we do belong in motorsport and behind the wheel as well, as Nanini has proven.
Olivier Panis was a very fast driver during the mid-90s for Ligier. He picked up a second-place finish during his inaugural and sophomore season in F1 in Hockenheim 1994 and Adelaide 1995. He picked up another sole podium in 1996, but it was on the top step at Monaco in the race only three drivers finished on a lead lap. He kept his head together and kept his car in one piece when 90% of the field didn't. Things were looking up during 1997 as a newly rebranded Prost team showed race-winning potential in the opening third of the season. Panis picked up third in Brazil and second in Spain, and after that round in Catalonia, he was third in the Drivers' Championship. However, at the next race in Canada, he crashed during the race, breaking both of his legs and had to miss seven further races. When he came back, he scored points first race back at the Nürburgring was sixth, and he finished the season ninth in points. But just imagine how that season could have gone had he not crashed in Canada. He may have completely altered his career trajectory and the trajectory of a Prost team. After the Prost team fell off a cliff in performance in 1998 and 1999, Panis sat out a year before returning to F1 with BAR in 2001, staying through 2002, although the team hadn't reached its peak yet, and his best result in either year was fourth in Brazil 2001. He then joined Toyota in 2003, but again failed to capitalise in average machinery. Panis showed great potential at Ligier and Prost, but his injury came at the worst time of his career, and it's a damn shame because everyone would have loved to have seen an underdog team like Prost try and take it to the likes of Williams and Ferrari. Sorry. I have a soft spot for Pastor Maldonado, because although he crashed a lot, it was clear he had bundles of raw talent. After winning GP2 in 2010, he signed for Williams in 2011, but had a lackluster debut campaign, only scoring one point in Spa. 2012, however, was a different kettle of fish. In the first race of the season, in Australia, he was in sixth place, chasing Fernando Alonso for fifth, until on the last lap, he dipped a wheel onto the grass, coming out of what was then turn six, and is now still turn six but reprofiled, and spun out of the race. He managed to get eighth in the third race of the season in China, but his day of days came in the Spanish race, round five of the season. After Lewis Hamilton was sent to the back of the grid for a fuel infringement, it was Maldonado who was credited with the pole as he was second behind Lewis. Passer's teammate Bruno Senna, meanwhile, failed to even get out of Q1 and his Q1 time was two and a half seconds off the Venezuelan's pole time. In the race, Williams and Pasta executed a brilliant strategy to usurp Fernando Alonso after originally losing out at the start. To be honest, that Williams was probably quicker than eighth in the constructors that year, but still, that was not even top five best cars that year, yet Maldonado dragged it to a win. He then failed to score in the next nine races after his win, which is a statistic most people use against Pasta. However, he was hit by bad luck in some of these races. In Valencia, he was on for third until Lewis Hamilton decided that he was going to force Maldonado off track unnecessarily and take them both out of a race. He qualified third in Spa, but started sixth due to a penalty. And he jumped the start, getting up to second briefly before being collected by Roman Grosjean's cock-up in Turn 1. In Singapore, he qualified on the front row and was running fifth when his hydraulics went. He scored points a few more times, including getting fifth in Abu Dhabi, but he was insanely unlucky during that 2012 season. It seemed he had the ability to always be caught in incidents that were his fault when he was fighting for meaningless positions, but got caught in incidents that weren't his fault when he was running in the top 10. He lost at least 50 points that season in incidents that weren't his fault, and his average qualifying position was 8.75, which was definitely not where that Williams was supposed to be. Anyway, on to the rest of his career. 2013 was shit. A rookie Valtteri Bottas outshone him in what was a wank car, and the same happened in 2014 as he switched to Lotus paired with Roman Grosjean. 2015, however, was a different story. He showed great mid and late season form to be one of the best of the rest as he picked up a smattering of 7th and 8th place finishers towards the end of the season. It's a shame he didn't stay on with a rebranded Renault team or move elsewhere that could try and get the best out of him, because on his day, Maldonado was a world beater. He was crash prone, but not every incident he ever had was his fault. Francois Sever was another young F1 prodigy taken before he had a chance to improve on his one win tally. After making his full-time F1 debut towards the back end of 1970, Sever came on strong in 1971 as he came third in the driver's standings, claiming four podiums, including a win at the last race of the season in Watkins Glen. 1972 saw two more podiums, and in 1973, Sever looked like he was going to take third in the driver's standings again, and assume the reins of the retiring Jackie Stewart as a number one driver at Tyrrell. Sadly, during qualifying, Sever crashed at the S's, and due to structural issues with the barrier, his car went underneath the barrier. Francoise's body did as well, minus his head. He had been another one-time winner needlessly killed due to a lack of safety in F1, and this death urged Jackie Stewart to retire a race earlier than planned out of respect for his fallen teammate. So there was 29. On a happier note, Esteban Ocon is the first currently active driver on this list, but he's also probably the least likely of the four active drivers to get another win. He made his debut driving for Manor at the back end of 2016, then he moved to Force India in 2017, partnering Sergio Perez. 
He kept up with the Mexican pace-wise, although the two had numerous comings together on track. After Lawrence Stroll bought Force India and hired his son Lance for 2019, Esteban sat on the sidelines for a year before signing for Renault in 2020. He struggled having had a year out, but in the chaotic race at the Sakia Alta circuit, Ocon finished second, claiming his first career podium. In 2021, Renault rebranded to Alpine and he was now going to be partnered by a 40-year-old returning Fernando Alonso, and Fernando mostly matched or beat the Frenchman, although Fernando's best result of a third-place finish in Qatar was definitely trumped by Ocon's win in a chaotic Hungarian race. 2022 was much of the same as Fernando topped Esti Besti, but for 2023, Esteban has had a new teammate in the form of Pierre Gasly. Both drivers have been very close performance-wise, although Ocon and Gasly have both taken podiums this season in Monaco and Zandvoort. Esteban is a very good driver, however, often ruffles feathers with his teammates, although things haven't blown up with Pierre just yet. Speaking of Pierre, he's here in 7th. After debuting for Toro Rosso towards the end of the 2017 season, he impressed in 2018 by decimating his Le Mans winning teammate, Brendan Hartley. His promotion to Red Bull went about as well as having a threesome with Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby, and he was demoted to Toro Rosso again before the Belgian Grand Prix. Despite the death of his close friend Antoine Hubert, he put in a strong ending to the season, climaxing with a second place in Interlagos. 2020 was more of the same, as he put together another solid season, outperforming his more experienced teammate Danny Kvyat, and he got his first and so far only win in Monza, holding off a late race charge from Carlos Sainz. 2021 was much of the same, including a third place in Baku, and his stock was rising in F1. 2022 was a downturn for Alfa Tauri, as the team started to fade into obscurity, then as he didn't see a clear path back into Red Bull, Gasly left Alfa Tauri to join Alpine for 2023. He's been consistent even when the car hasn't been good, and Pierre is on a very similar level to teammate Esteban Ocon, and it was very hard to split the two performance-wise, which is why I put them together in this ranking. John Alacy was a very well-loved but also a mistake-prone driver. He made his debut for Tyrrell in 1989 at the French Grand Prix, finishing fourth, and managed to score points twice again that season, with fifth in Monza and fourth again in Jerez. He kicked off 1990 with a bang, leading the race in Phoenix until he battled with Ayrton Senna and was overtaken, so he had to settle for second place. Jean got second in Monaco as well, but apart from a sixth place in Imola, he couldn't score any other points that season. For 1991, Alessi moved to Ferrari just as the Scuderia entered their early to mid-90s slump. He finished 7th in points in 91 with 3 third places to his name, but in 1992 could only amass 2 podiums, again finishing 7th in the standings. 1993 and 94 were nothing much to speak about, but in 95, Alessi got his first and only win in Canada on his 31st birthday. After great service to the Scuderia, he was booted out for 1996, and he and his ex-Ferrari teammate Gerhard Berger moved to Benetton. He got more than double Berger's points in 96, and outscored Gerhard again in 97, although the Austrian did miss three races due to a sinus illness and the death of his father. Alessi was off to Salva for 1998, although in two seasons for the team, his best result was third in Spa 1998. 2000 would get even worse as he joined Pros Grand Prix and had the first non-point scoring season of his career. 2001 looked slightly up, but midway through the season, Alacy switched seats with Heinz Old Frenton, who was driving for Jordan up until that point. Alacy scored five points that year and promptly retired from F1, having not been offered up a competitive seat elsewhere. He could be a great driver on his day, however, he was too mistake-prone to be a world champion, as Ayrton Senna had touted him to be after their battle in Phoenix in 1990. John O'Trulli was a similar type of driver to John Alacy, aggressive and error-prone. His big break came in the Austrian Grand Prix of his first season driving for Prost after Olivier Panis broke his legs earlier in the season. Trulli led 37 of the 71 laps before engine troubles put him down the order and then out of the race. His next few years were a lot of nothing results-wise, but he got a reputation as a solid midfield contender. After moving to Jordan, then to Renault, he had two very competitive seasons in 2003 and in 2004, with the latter being the year he took his only win in Monaco. Towards the end of the 2004 season, he was fired from Renault by Flavio Briatore for losing out on a podium at the team's spiritual home at the French Grand Prix. This seems odd to me, because Trulli was actually leading his teammate Alonso in the standings when he was dropped. When you've got Flav as your boss, your job is never safe. Jarno then joined Toyota, but that team made only minimal progression in the four years he was there. He did pick up seven podiums, but never got more than that one elusive win. Toyota pulling out of F1 curtailed Trulli's F1 career, as although he joined Lotus, it was clear he wasn't as dedicated. So after two seasons and a best result of three 13th places, he left F1 after 2012 pre-season testing wrapping up what was, at the time, one of the longest careers in F1 history in terms of starts, with 252. Richard Ginther made his F1 debut with none other than Scuderia Ferrari in 1960. Then he switched to BRM in 1962 and got third in the driver standings in 1963, then got fifth in 64. In 1965, he became part of the Honda Works team, and at the last race of the season in Mexico, he won. 
Sadly, this was his final F1 podium, as his last two seasons in 1966 and 67 were podiumless, and he didn't even start a race in 1967, failing to qualify in Monaco before not even attending the Dutch Grand Prix. He got eight second places and five thirds, but only the one win, and it's a shame he couldn't do more, because he probably deserved as much success, if not more, as his temporaries, such as Dan Gurney. Carlos Sainz Jr. joined F1 in 2015, off the back of winning Formula Renault 3.5 the year prior. After spending three years acclimatising to F1 driving for Toro Rosso towards the back end of 2017, the Renault works team was becoming disgruntled with the underperforming Jolie and Palmer and drafted in science to see out the last four races of the season before joining the team full-time in 2018. He lost a teammate battle to Nico Hulkenberg in 2018, then he was off to his third team in 18 months for 2019, partnering Lando Norris at McLaren. He spent two seasons there, picking up his first career podium in Brazil 2019, and in 2020, he really came on strong, finishing sixth place in the point standings and taking a career-best second place at Monza, beating Norris in the standings. His stock was rising, and with Sebastian Vettel leaving Ferrari at the end of 2020, Carlos was one picked to fill the German shoes. He was a regular top eight contender and picked up four podiums, including a second place in Monaco in 2021. Then as his teammate Charles Leclerc became a title contender in 2022, Carlos stepped up his game again, taking nine podiums and his first and so far only win in Silverstone. He was initially told to give the win to Charles through team orders, but ignored the radio call and drove on to victory. 2023 has seen Ferrari slip down the performance ladder, and while Carlos has still been performing well, it has taken him until Monza and round 14 to take his first podium finish of the season. Carlos might not be future champion potential, but he definitely has more potential race wins under his belt. George Russell came up just short of best in this ranking, and after a pointless first season in 2019 driving awful Williams machinery, 2020 saw him pick up the pace as the car got better. He missed out on points in Imola due to a costly mistake spinning out under safety car, but took his first career points in Sakia, subbing in for Lewis Hamilton at Mercedes. George could have won that race, but Mercedes strategy decided that wasn't going to happen, and he got P9 with fastest lap instead. 2021 saw him pick up his first podium after finishing second in the farcical Belgian Grand Prix. Then for 2022, he left Williams to join Mercedes full-time, replacing Valtteri Bottas. He picked up eight podiums across the season, with the last one coming in Sao Paulo when he won after spinning out in qualifying. He outscored Lewis points-wise in 2022, but is losing out this season in 2023 at the moment. He is touted by many as a future world champion if Mercedes can get that act together and give him and Lewis Hamilton a world championship winning car. Robert Kubica is one of the biggest what-ifs in F1 history. He got his F1 debut at Hungary in 2006 after Jacques Villeneuve was injured in a crash at Hockenheim. He got his first podium in his third career race at Monza, then in 2007 he put on a solid season despite missing one race due to his accident in the Canadian Grand Prix, taking sixth in the driver's standings despite not getting a podium all year. 2008 looked to be even better as he got his first career win in Canada, and with that result he took the lead in the championship early on in the season. Then BMW Sauber decided not to focus their development on their championship potential car that they already had in front of them, but instead chose to put all development focus on the 2009 regulations. Robert only got fourth in the standings in 2008 as he only took three more podiums after the Canada win. And do you know the car that BMW were developing for 2009? Well, it was utter dog shit. Robert only got one podium all year, although it could have been two if he hadn't have crashed with Vettel in Australia. As Robert moved to Renault following the withdrawal of BMW as Sauber's engine supplier, 2010 was a good year for Robert personally, as he overshadowed teammate Vitaly Petrov the whole season and picked up three podiums. However, the what most didn't know after that season finished was that it would be another eight and a half years before he would drive a full Grand Prix weekend again. He got involved in a rally accident in early 2011 that partially severed his right forearm, and it was a long and arduous process to get back to Formula 1. He did some tests with Renault in 2017 and Williams in 2018, then took a race seat at Williams in 2019 using sponsorship money to pay his way into the seat. He was outclassed by rookie teammate George Russell all season, but in the one race where it mattered as they were in a shot for points, Robert was on top. He finished 10th in Hockenheim, one place ahead of George, but had no other standout results. He left Williams at the end of the year to become Alfa Romeo's test and reserve driver and got one final hurrah in 2021 when Kimi Raikkonen had to miss the Dutch and Italian Grand Prix due to a virus that shall not be named. Robert was uninspiring in these outings, but he inspired many young disabled people by showing them that they can reach F1 and be competitive if they've got the skill. All of these drivers, though, are or were incredibly talented, but in my opinion, Robert shines through as the best. Anyway, that's the video over. I hope you all enjoyed my ranking. Please tell me what you think of it in the comments below. Do you think I was right? Do you think I was wrong? Where, who do you think I missed out and who do you think should be higher or lower? Anyway, I'll see you all later and I'll see you next week with a new video. I've been Nedzo and until later, goodbye.